Anything worth doing is worth doing right. Whatever it takes. Love others like you love yourself. You need to learn how to laugh at yourself every once in a while. Teamwork makes the dream work. Respect your friends and know. Say sorry without adding a but. You can take a turn and then I get it back. You're free to do whatever you want, kid. Just remember, there's consequences to every choice you make. Treat people the way you want to be treated. Good morning, Every Nation Cincinnati. Whether you're here in, lo- here in person or online, our in-person crew is a little bit thin today because a whole bunch of our college students are actually on in a van right now coming back from a uh, conference uh, with a bunch of other thousands of college students from um, across the country. So that's why it's a little bit less than full in here right now. But it is my privilege today to welcome us but also to finish up our sermon series here in the book of Proverbs. We've been calling it Abiding Wisdom. Now, that idea of wisdom actually means knowing what is true and right, then applying it. Oftentimes, we gain wisdom through mistakes we make, learning some of the hard lessons in life, but other times we can actually learn from somebody else who has some wisdom on their life. Maybe they've got some scars, and we can avoid them ourselves by listening and learning from what they have to say. So Proverbs here, most of of the book, and including today's chapter, we're going to be in chapter 27, since today is February 27th, and we will be talking about King Solomon, and these are some of his Proverbs. Now, how did King Solomon get to be so wise? Well, I want us to look at a few verses out of 1 Kings chapter 3 that give us the backstory about Solomon becoming the wisest man who ever lived. This is what happened in verse 5. At Gibeon, the Lord appeared to Solomon during the night in a dream, and God said, ask for whatever you want me to give you. And then here was Solomon's ask of God in verse 9. So give your servant a discerning heart to govern your people and to distinguish between right and wrong. For who is able to govern this great people of yours? The Lord was pleased that Solomon had asked for this. So God said to him, Since you have asked for this and not for long life or wealth for yourself, nor have asked for the death of your enemies, but for discernment and administering justice, I will do what you have asked. I will give you a wise and discerning heart, so that there will never have been anyone like you, nor will there ever be. So in this section of the book, we have a collection of sayings, these proverbs, from who the Lord says wasn't just the wisest person to live up until that time, but the wisest person, even wiser than anyone today or in the future. We're going to listen to him today, amen? So the chapter 27 is not a sermon, it's not a history lesson for us. There's a lot of different topics that are referenced, and I have a lot of different things to, to decide whether to choose or not. So I decided to try to find a few nuggets of wisdom. Now, one thing I decided not to do was I decided not to preach about verse 15. Let me read that for us. A quarrelsome wife is like the dripping of a leaky roof in a rainstorm. Restraining her is like restraining the wind or grasping oil with the hand. I've earned this gray hair, and I am not going to touch that verse with a 10-foot pole. All right? So um, I also could have chosen verse 14 which says, if anyone loudly blesses their neighbor early in the morning, it will be taken as a curse. Interesting thing about what you do. Don't be mowing your grass at 6 a.m., okay? But instead, we're going to focus today on verse 17, which says, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. The title today is Iron Sharpens Iron, How God Uses People to Shape and Sharpen our character. Let's pray. God, I pray that today, Lord, you would take this wisdom and you would open our eyes, God, to be able to see what you're speaking to us. God, that we would hear your voice in all this. And that, God, we wouldn't just gain more knowledge, but we would apply it to our lives and grow in wisdom ourselves. May we abide there in that wisdom in Jesus' name. Amen. 
All right, so the phenomenon of binge watching, right? It didn't exist just since the pandemic happened, but how many of you had a few extra hours, weeks, months uh, to, to watch TV, maybe to binge watch some things you hadn't watched before, you know, these last couple of years? Well, there was one of those shows that I had never heard of, my son turned me on to, called Forged in Fire. Anybody else ever seen that or clips from that? Well, apparently it's amateur bladesmiths. Okay, it's a reality show where these amateur bladesmiths try to recreate swords and knives that have historical significance. And then they slash and cut these crazy things to, to prove which sword will hold up. So I didn't know that there was a thing to be an amateur bladesmith, nor that you could actually have your own backyard forge, like a blacksmith. But you know what? Things you learn during the pandemic. But this idea of what these bladesmiths do and how they sharpen knives, how they create swords, it made it interesting when I read this first as iron sharpens iron. Now, it jumped out to me in a different way. What do we normally need to sharpen things? Right? We sharpen knives, maybe your kitchen knives, scissors. Maybe they don't cut like they used to, they get dull. We sharpen them so that what? So these tools can become more useful. But people sharpening each other? Well, let's put that verse back up on the screen here, verse 17. I want to do a little inductive Bible study, some observation method. Our senior pastor, Pastor Brian, he is a professor of preaching. He also is an expert in teaching folks how to study their Bible. And so we're going to look at this. Now, there's nine words here in this verse. I see the word iron. It's mentioned twice. The word sharpens. It's mentioned twice as well. Interesting. Interesting. I also see a literary device here, the as, as so. That's refer to any middle school English folks, a simile, right? We're comparing a couple things. What are we comparing here? Well, it's not just comparing iron to people, but it's the sharpening of people like he sharpened iron. This idea of sharpening, if you turn out, if you look in actually in the Hebrew, the original language, this last part of the verse says, as one person sharpens the face of another. Now that translation doesn't really work very well in our modern day, sharpening your face. But the Hebrews would understand that's referring to character and sharpening and honing one's character. Interesting. So today we're going to focus on not just how our character grows, but how God uses other people to sharpen and shape our character. So the first point today, we are sharpened by the company we keep. Who do you hang around with? You ever heard the phrase, bad company corrupts good morals or good character? Well, well that's true, but the reverse also can be true, right? Good company can actually grow and improve our character. People can influence those around them, and we are influenced by those we allow close. Who do you let speak into your life? Do you have mentors, people that can provide wise counsel? We think about usually mentors in the setting of careers, right? Maybe somebody who's farther along in their career path than you are, somebody who is where you want to be someday. Now, they also can give us advice on what classes to take or what jobs to get, but they can also write letters of recommendation, right? They can give us good advice. But we also need spiritual mentors, not just career ones. Godly men or women who can, who, whose character, they're mature, they, they, they love Jesus, their life exudes the character of God. They're farther along the path than we are, and they can, they can and should speak into our lives to help us grow in that way. So that, you know what? People who can also see where we get a little bit dull and see when we kind of lose our edge, they can help us be more effective for the kingdom of God. Now, today is not only our last um, week in this sermon series, but it's also the last Sunday of Black History Month. Now, as someone who is obviously not African-American, I take the opportunity um, during February usually to educate myself about some person or some people that are amazing. I may have never heard about. And one of those pe people that I recently learned about um, wasn't nearly himself as famous as the person who he mentored. Can you put up that picture for us? Does anybody know this gentleman who he is? This is Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays. 
He was born in 1894. He was an American minister, a scholar, a social activist, and he became the president of Morehouse College in Atlanta between 1940 and 1967. Mays was also a significant mentor to a student who attended while he was the president, Martin Luther King Jr. Turns out Martin Luther King, when he entered Morehouse College, he was 15 years old. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Turns out young Martin skipped apparently ninth and 11th grades. Man was brilliant. While he was at Morehouse, very young, <laughs> Martin Luther King Jr. heard Dr. Mays speak in chapel every Tuesday. And he was fascinated by Dr. Mays' use of words, his challenging his students to rise and become more than what they were. In his words, to become Morehouse men, agents of change. Martin would later go on to get to know Dr. Mays outside of just those chapel services, and they developed a close relationship. Although Martin did major in sociology, he was influenced by a call to ministry and then attended seminary in Chester, Pennsylvania, and later did his doctorate studies at Boston University. This relationship between the mentor, Mays, and the mentee, King, was very special. Dr. King often called upon Benjamin Mays for advice and counsel long after he left college. He looked to Mays for wisdom and forthrightness when dealing with controversial decisions. Dr. King respected Dr. Mays, but in time, Dr. Mays respected Dr. King. It was one of the dreams of Dr. Mays that Martin Luther King would follow him as the president of Morehouse. But sadly, we all know God had other ideas um, about how Martin Luther's life would go. Dr. King would not have been the man he was without Benjamin Mays in his life. Of all the people who could have given the eulogy at Dr. King's funeral, do you know who the family chose? Benjamin Mays. Unfortunately for me, I didn't have someone like this mentoring me in my college days. As a sheltered, nerdy kid from Fairfield, Ohio, when I went to college, I didn't make always the best choices. Now, at the beginning of my college career, I kind of had one foot in the campus ministry, and then I decided to join a fraternity. Now, end of my first semester when a young lady I had started dating um, in the campus ministry that didn't work out, I decided, you know what? I need a break from God. It's usually not a wise thing to do. Fast forward to my sophomore year, and I get my first D on a test ever in my life. And for some of you, that may not, have been, may not have been a big deal for you, but that was crushing for me, and it was kind of the slap in the face that God used to get my attention. Who's influencing you? And I realized, ooh, the living situation I'm in, the people I'm around, they're not just influencing my grades and my future job prospects, my career. They're actually influencing my character. So I decided then and there, I'm quitting, I'm dropping out of the fraternity. And then God said, eh, actually... You may have gotten into this for the wrong reasons, but you know what? I'm going to use you now, but it's going to be really hard. And you can't do it alone. You're going to need to walk with other brothers and sisters in Christ to do it. So I joined back into a life group on campus. I started going to church again. And the next semester, my best friend fraternity, he kind of got right with God. And then there was two of us. We started a Bible study in the fraternity and invited everybody, but you know what? For a whole year, nobody else came, just he and I. But a funny thing happened my junior year. Suddenly, the same people who would mock me for my recommitment to Jesus, you're no fun anymore. You just stood the nursemaid cleaning up after people when they're vomiting at the parties, or the keeper of the keys to keep the drunk driving to a minimum. You know, some of those same guys started knocking on my door late at night after their girlfriend broke up with them, crying, asking for advice and wisdom. In fact, my big brother in the fraternity, turns out he gave his life to Christ after graduation, eventually became a youth pastor. His wife blames me for that career choice. <laughs> but you know what? The influence that had been negative in my life, God used me then to influence others, but it took a group of brothers and sisters to walk with that were my anchor to keep me grounded, to keep me focused on the right things at the same time. There's a lot of people who, they, a lot of Christians get afraid of 
being contaminated by the world, right? Oh, it's evil out there. There's so much negative. We're just going to hide away in our churches and our little Christian bubbles, go to our Christian gym, watch our Christian movies, just only hang out with Christians so we don't get contaminated out there. But you know what? That's not Jesus' pattern. Right? Jesus, he was accused of being a drunkard, a friend of sinners, hanging out with the prostitutes, the tax collectors. And the reality was Jesus walked with 12 men. He was connected, obviously, to his father. Jesus had an influence on them, though, and those outcasts became his own followers. Jesus influenced them like we can. So this idea of connecting with others here in the church, having anchors in our life, that's what God wants for us. If we're going to go out and live in the world, which God wants us to do, to be salt and light, it can't happen unless we're anchored and we're connected to those around us. We need godly relationships so we can grow, but also so that we can be sharpened to be effective tools in the master's hand so that we can influence others that don't yet know him, that we can expand the boundaries of the kingdom of God. But to do that, we need to be connected to others in the body. Can I ask you a question? Do you have people in your life that are mentors who can challenge you and encourage you? How about peers, brothers and sisters who walk alongside of you? What about mentees? What about folks that you're, you're, that you're discipling, that you're training up after you? For the parents in the room, your children, you're mentoring them, whether you realize it or not. That's why we have baby dedications to remind parents that, hey, you are, need to commit to helping to raise this child. The reality is children left on their own do not become highly functioning members of the kingdom of God or upstanding members of society. They have to be guided, honed, polished. In addition to those one-on-one -on -one situations, I find that some of the most impactful ways that I can be sharpened and challenged is in the idea of like a small group Bible study, a life group setting, serving together on a Sunday morning or on an outreach, going on a mission trip together. These are all ways that life on life can happen in a way that people get close enough to see us and encourage us. We are sharpened by the company we keep. I think there are some other golden nuggets of wisdom that are scattered throughout um, this collection of verses in chapter 27. Let's look a little bit further to flesh out some of these ideas. Let's look at verse 2. Let someone else praise you and not your own mouth, an outsider and not your own lips. And then verse 21, the crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but people are tested by their praise. Notice these verses deal with the idea of praise. Did you know that praise can be one of the ways that our characters can be developed? Praise is important. But if I'm being honest, for me, it's harder for me to receive praise sometimes than it is to receive correction. If you're like me and you kind of end up more on the perfectionistic side of things, sometimes it's easier to see your own mistakes and to realize where you fall short than it is to realize hmm, when you're doing it well. Anybody else identify with that some? Is it easy for you to receive praise? You see there's a, a, a right and a healthy way to deal with praise, but there also can be a wrong or unhealthy way to handle it. Which leads me to my second point. We are sharpened by the praise we receive. In our era of social media, one of the great dangers to our character is to become overly addicted to praise, to likes, to having followers. I think part of this is why so many young people today struggle with so many mental health issues. It's because of this desire to be liked and followed, the anxiety that goes along when not enough people are giving me enough attention or following me, and I'm comparing myself to everybody else. This, what happens is it can lead to relentless self-promotion and self-praise. We have to be careful because this can really lead to fakery. Do you know that everybody doesn't look that way on Instagram in real life? <laughs> People only put the best face on a lot of things online, don't they? It's not reality. Proverbs 7.2 says that we should allow others to praise us. We shouldn't be tooting our own horn all the time. Now, compare this to the kind of self-promotion that we see um, contrasted in the wife of noble character in Proverbs 31. 
Now, if you grew up in church at all, you've been around a while, you know that the Proverbs 31 woman can be used as a club to beat women, oftentimes, for falling short. And my wife tells me that women do this to themselves all the time, beating themselves up when they can't seem to live up to that superwoman ideal. But there are some important things to notice about what this idealized composite woman of noble character, what she is praised for. Let's look at a few of those. In Proverbs 31, starting in verse 28. Her children arise and call her blessed. Her husband also, he praises her. Here we see that those closest to her are the ones praising her and calling her blessed. The ones who don't just see her public persona and what she puts on the face when she leaves the house doing all of her exploits, but those who see what she looks like in private, that they're the same person. She's consistent in who she is in private and in public. And those closest who could see the flaws, they are the ones praising her. Verse 29, many women do noble things, but you surpass them all. Charm is deceptive and beauty is fleeting, but a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. Notice here, it's not the superficial Instagram-worthy things like charm and beauty, which here garners the praise, but it's her what? Her fear of the Lord. And then verse 31, honor her for all that her hands have done and let her works bring her praise at the city gate. Her accomplishments and the legacy of her life are seen and celebrated not by just her, but by those who are living in the seats of power in the city. She doesn't have to manufacture the praise because you know why? Her actions speak for themselves. Her character sings her praise. And those in charge notice. How can you sharpen those around you? Well, when we see someone doing something well, you know what? We should praise them, commend them. When we see someone make a wise decision that reflects the character of Christ, we should celebrate that, especially as parents. Our children need not just our correction, they need our praise as well. The Bible says to give honor where honor is due. So I would like to praise a couple people in our midst. Is Marcel Lanton in here? in this service. I think she was serving downstairs and kids. She might be doing that again. But Marcel, I'm told by the, our Next Gen director and those in our kids' ministry, she's one of the teachers of the next generation downstairs. Marcel apparently prepares her lessons weeks in advance. She comes always ready to teach and excited. She doesn't just show up faithfully on the, the weeks that she's scheduled. You know what Marcel does? When there's a need and somebody else is out sick or can't come, Marcel is always ready to volunteer. Can we honor Marcel and honor God through her for her faithfulness? I'd also like to give honor where honor is due Ed Coburn. Is Ed in here? Ed in the back. I want to give a shout out to Ed because you know what? Ed, God's gotten a hold of Ed in this last year. Ed not only has completed our Discipleship 101 and he's gone through our Discipleship 201, but Ed loves to serve. Ed shows up at the church at all hours of the day and night, days when he's scheduled and not. Ed inventoried the hospitality closet the other day just because nobody had done it, and Ed wanted to be helpful. Ed wanted us to serve. Now Ed's dreaming up ways to go outreach and do all kinds of things around the city. God is using Ed, and I want to honor what God's doing in our midst through this man. Amen? Thank you, Ed, for your service here in our midst. We all need encouragement to counteract the self-doubt, the insecurities, maybe even the self-loathing that some of us feel. But the flip side of praise is that praise is also a test. How we handle that praise. Do we let it puff us up and lead to pride? Because if that's the case, then the next time we may be getting the rebuke on the back end. Or do we allow praise to come and receive it with humility and gratitude to God for the ability he's given us to do things well, to reflect his character. Because that will lead to maturity when we can handle praise well. Words have power. Words of praise can build us up or puff us up, but words also can harm us as well. Maybe you've heard the old playground response, sticks and stones may break my bones, but 
words will never hurt me, right? Or maybe this one, I'm rubber and you're glue. Whatever you say bounces off me and sticks to you, right? How I wish those were true, <laughs> right? But the reality is those things that we teach kids to say to not let the words hurt them, they still hurt, right? How many of you still have those scars from the playground or the middle school, lunchroom, or wherever it is that somebody says those things and they, they hurt us? Words can cut us. Words can damage us, our self-esteem and our ability to see ourselves as God does. If you've been through our Experiencing Spiritual Freedom Day, you know that we spend a lot of time deconstructing some of those wounds, calling out the lies of the enemy that we believed. But not all cuts are bad. Let's look at a few more verses in Proverbs 27. Verse 5 and 6 says, Better is open rebuke than hidden love. Or verse 6, Wounds from a friend can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. That leads me to my final point. We are sharpened by the correction we need. Wounds from a friend, really? The reality is that for our character to grow, we need to be polished. We need to be sharpened and developed. We need correction, godly correction, and even rebuke at times when we're doing it wrong. As much as we need words of praise to build us up, we also need people in our life who can hold up a mirror to show us when we got it wrong, where the blemishes are. Too often, I think we don't like to see ourselves as we really are. Amen? Doesn't it hurt sometimes when somebody else notices that thing that you thought you were good at hiding and they see through it? Rather than just adding more makeup, godly friends that can help reveal that issue can actually help bring healing, not just there to cut us, to wound us. However, not everyone's a friend. Anyone have some frenemies who multiply kisses? Maybe a, a more modern term would be flattery. Always just giving flattery. Oh, you look so good. All these things just when they're not actually really telling the truth. Kind of like that fable, right? The emperor has no clothes. Right? Oh, look at that wonderful gown. Hey, look at that wonderful robe. When the guy's walking around without clothes on. That flattery doesn't encourage us. What happens is it keeps us locked in our woundedness, keeps us dull. It doesn't help us. Real friends, godly friends, brothers and sisters in Christ, they want the best for us. And sometimes that means we have to tell each other things that we might not want to hear. It hurts sometimes. But those wounds from a friend, the Bible says, can be trusted. Wisdom of the world says we need safe spaces where we never get hurt, never get offended, never made to feel uncomfortable. The wisdom of God turns that on its head and says the church is meant to be a safe space. But it's not because we're never cut, but it's safe because God is good and he loves us. But the love of God is not the flattery kind of love, which says you're fine just the way you are. No, the kind of love that God has for us is the kind which wants to cut out the cancer of sin in our life. It's the kind of love which forces us to be connected to others in the body of Christ. We don't, God doesn't give us the option of Lone Ranger Christianity. But in those connections, as we're connected one to another in the body of Christ, it means we're going to be elbow to elbow, maybe rubbing one another the wrong way sometimes. Did you know that God uses other people to help rub some of those rough edges, not just off of them, but also off of us? It can grind down those edges by which we needlessly hurt others. It's when I'm close enough to be offended by somebody that I can say, hey, you know, when you said it that way, that was really kind of harsh. I love you, but I'm going to say, you can't say it like that. If we never get offended, it means we never let people close enough to be able to offend us. And the fact is that God's message to us, the gospel itself is offensive. It says that I don't have it good enough. I'm not there yet. I can't do it on my own. And I need somebody to help point that out to me, that we don't have it all together. We all need correction. 
and even rebuke at times if we're going to become not just the best version of ourselves in our own flesh, but the version of ourselves that God sees. God sees that what he wants to be to transforming us into the image of his son, Jesus. But to get there, it's going to require some cuts and some shaping of our character. Will we stay on the operating table long enough to let God through others cut and bring healing? Or will we crawl off the table, continuing on sick in our pathology? As we close, can you close your eyes for me and do a little self-reflection? Can I ask you a few questions? Do you let people close? What kind of company do you keep? Do you have those godly mentors or brothers and sisters that, that you can let close enough to help sharpen you? How about praise? Do you have an unhealthy relationship with praise? Or do you deflect praise and never allow it to encourage you? Do you receive praise with humility? Or is pride more of the struggle? Are you stingy with your praise to others? Lord, I pray that today, God, that you would reveal in our hearts, God, where we maybe hold people at arm's length. And if you've been hurt yourself, if you've said, listen, I've let people close and, and people have cut me in the wrong way. And they, they, they said they were doing it in love, but it was really just about them. I'm sorry. That's not God's best for you. But I promise you, shutting everyone else out and doing it on your own is not the answer either. Lord, I pray that you would help us to become the kind of congregation where we are more connected to one another, where there's that genuine sense of love and encouragement. God, we're members of the body, God, that we need one another to become the kind of people, not just individually that you want us to be, but the kind of people, God, that can influence a watching world around us the world is so broken and you need the body of Christ to be built up. Mature men and women of God who can walk confident into a dark and dirty world. Secure, though, in the relationships of brothers and sisters who have their back. And that we can have an influence on this world, not just the world defiling us. God, help us, I pray, to be those kind of people, sharp and ready on mission with you. In Jesus' name, amen.